Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would indeed cause us to know with all our hearts that his wounds have paid our ransom. And God, we pray that you would cause us to hate sin, to resist evil, to stand against the devil, not with him. Make us those who worship you, we pray. For the name of Christ, amen. I would ask you to pray for me this morning. Uh, my throat, my head, my chest are not what they typically are, so I would pray for grace and strength that I might uh, make it through this. So, appreciate your prayers. Is your life about you, or is your life about God? I would invite you to turn to Psalm 36. And we will see David describe people whose, life, whose lives are about themselves. And you, you'll notice an outline in your bulletin, <clears throat> um, verses 1 through 4, the way of the wicked. We could have entitled this, I could have entitled this, the worship of the wicked. Because for the wicked, whose lives are about themselves, they are worshiping every bit as much as the righteous are worshiping. They are worshiping sin, or perhaps themselves, but we are all worshipers. So is your life about you, or is your life about God? Are you a worshiper of sin and self, or are you a worshiper of God? Psalm 36, this psalm that's before us, is about where satisfaction can be found. The first four verses of this psalm Discuss the way that the wicked seek their fullness and their, their joy, their delight, their refreshment. They seek it in sin. And then the rest of the psalm, verses 5 through 12, is where we want to be. Because the rest of the psalm celebrates the incomparable delight of knowing God. So let's look together at, at this psalm. Psalm 36, the, the superscription tells us this is a uh, to the choir master of David, the servant of the Lord. Incidentally, uh, the only other psalm in the Psalter that, that refers to the servant of the Lord is Psalm 18, verse 1. <clears throat> and then that, that reference to the servant also links up with verse 27 of Psalm 35, where <clears throat> the righteous, are, David says, let those who delight in my righteousness Shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, great is the Lord who delights in the welfare of his servant. So uh, there are connections here between Psalms 35 and 36. But here in Psalm 36, in the first four verses, David is going to describe for us the way of the wicked. The, the ESV renders, like the NAS, the first verse, something like this. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. But if you're looking at the CSB or the KJV or the NIV, uh, it, it'll, it'll say something like this, an oracle of transgression in my heart. So the difference is whose heart is in view. And I, I'm inclined to think that we should go with, with uh, my heart, David speaking, but it really it doesn't change the, the meaning. It changes the meaning of this one line, but the, in the whole section, David is, is talking about the wicked and the way of the wicked. And, and let's consider what the ESV text would mean if we, if we go with it that way, the ESV and the NAS. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. Is there resonance between your heart and sin? That's, that's what this is saying. This is saying that there is a communion in the heart's of the wicked with sin, transgression. It speaks to you. That would be the meaning of, of the ESV. If it's the other way, as you, you can notice in the footnote there, if you're looking at an ESV, some Hebrew manuscripts, etc., in my heart, if it's David, what he's doing is he's saying um, something like an oracle of the sin of the wicked in my heart. So he's now reflecting on the wicked. And this is what he says about them there in verse 1. 
There is no fear of God before his eyes. There is no fear of God before his eyes. We'll come back to this idea as we continue. Look at what he says next there in verse 2. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. And again, there's some discrepancy between the translations, so I'll, I'll make a comment about uh, what, it, what it could mean either way. Let's start with the, the way the ESV has it. And, and uh, uh, let's, let's just go with this meaning here. He flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. He doesn't fear God, and so he doesn't think he's going to be found out. And he doesn't think he's going to be suffering the consequences of his sin. Because that's what happens to us, isn't it? If our sin is exposed, people are revolted by it. Rightfully so, because sin is heinous. It's ugly. And, and those who don't fear God, they don't think they're going to be exposed. The, the, the other way that this could be rendered, and there are some translations that go this way, uh, say something like this. The meaning is not that different. They, they say that, that David is uh, he's, he's flattering himself uh, with the result that he, he doesn't find and hate his sin. And, and if we take it that way, what it means is this person doesn't really probe his own heart. He doesn't fear God, And so he doesn't really see the evil of his own transgression. He doesn't probe his heart. He doesn't look past the the surface level things that he's willing to acknowledge into the real heart of the root of the evil within him. Not probing the depths of sin, not experiencing God which would result in a purging and painful exposure and the cleansing power of God's holiness. And so the depths of of sin is not really explored. Do you feel the sinfulness of your sin? Does it scare you? Do you fear God? On January 1st of this year, 2016... Derek Webb, a name that many of you probably will recognize, put up a post on his Tumblr page in which he made a confession about the way that he had cheated and the resulting end of his marriage. And in this post where he discusses his own sin that led to his divorce, he made these poignant statements. He said, trust takes years to build and seconds to break. And then he went on to say, I simply cannot change what I've done, nor the consequences. I can only own these despicable actions which have left me completely devastated and deeply ashamed. Sometimes no matter how bad you want it or how hard you fight for it, broken things just can't be mended. His marriage is over. He went on to say, You might be seriously considering choices that could destroy your life, your family, and maybe yourself. If that's you, please listen to me. What you think you want, what you think you can have is not real, and you'll lose real things pursuing it. Do you feel the sinfulness of your sin? Do you fear God? David says about the wicked here that there's, that there's no fear of God before their eyes and that they flatter themselves about their sin, that it's not going to be found out and hated. And then there's a kind of progression here. You've got what's going on in the heart of the wicked and, and in, his, in his own eyes, his thought processes in verses 1 and 2, and then what comes out of his mouth in verse 3. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. When we sin, we don't act in accordance with the truth. And then, when we don't act in accordance with the truth, if we don't make a full confession and repent of our sin, anything we we say will not be in accord with the truth. Derek Webb, again, from that post, he said, I believed lies which led me to tell 
lies. There's a, there's a progression from the way that wicked speaks to us in our hearts to what this disregard for God. And then we, we tell ourselves our sin's not so bad, and then we lie about it. And then look at verse 3. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. This language of acting wisely, it has resonance throughout the Psalter. Psalm, Psalm chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, Therefore, O kings, be wise and do what? Repent of your sin. Psalm 14, 2. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who do good, who act wisely. Psalm 32, verse 8. David says, I will cause you to be wise. I will teach you wisdom. Now let's think about the the context of those psalms. Psalm 2 is a psalm about the Davidic king, Yahweh's king. Those who don't act wise, they don't submit to God's king. Psalm 14, remember the opening words of that psalm? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So he doesn't fear him. The fool doesn't acknowledge the Lord as God. Psalm 32, it's about experiencing forgiveness because you've confessed your sin. The fool doesn't confess his sin. He doesn't act wisely. So there's wisdom on the other side of the fool's actions, isn't there? Acknowledge the king. Submit to the Lord as God. Confess your sin. That's the way of wisdom. So the wicked man, he starts by not fearing God there in verse 1. And he doesn't recognize the sinful character of his impulses and his inclinations. We see that there in verse 2. He flatters himself in his own eyes. And then he speaks wicked things. And then he stops doing good things. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. And and what you have here is a a cultivated way of life. And and the the description of it is continued there in verse 4. He plots trouble while on his bed. When he's alone in the dark on his bed, when he's unoccupied, when there's nothing else that he has to do, he plots trouble. He contemplates evil. He fantasizes about forbidden things. This was really convicting as I, as I thought about it this week, and, and I would invite you to, to come under the conviction by, by looking at where your mind goes. Where, where does your mind go when there's nothing that you have to be doing? When there's nothing that, that's occupying your attention, nothing that's engaging your intelligence, what do you think about? Last night as I was waking up repeatedly in the middle of the night, it was like my, I, would, I would catch myself going places, whether it's anxiety or, or desire for a claim or whatever, all these evil impulses at work in my heart, wicked desires, and, and, I, and I just kept praying, Lord, don't let me pro- plot trouble while I'm on my bed. Where our minds go when we're not thinking about anything else reveals what we consider to be ultimate, reveals what we most desire. It's a revelation of what we worship, What we contemplate in our unoccupied moments, it shows what we really love. Look at what the verse goes on to say there in verse 4. He sets himself in a way that is not good. Again, this is language that has resonance with earlier statements in the Psalter. Because the wicked kings, they set themselves in Psalm 2-2 against the Lord and against his anointed. Have you noticed how if you try to continue in a path of sin that you know you shouldn't be on, it really takes persistence. It really takes a concentrated effort sometimes to set yourself in that way that's not good. And that way that's not good, that's the way that the blessed man doesn't walk on. Blessed is the man who doesn't, he doesn't um, stand with the sinners or walk in the way of the wicked. We don't want to set ourselves in a way that's not good. And then lastly, there in verse 4, he does not reject evil. Those who do not reject evil will be rejected by God. We have to train ourselves by grace 
to look past the surface allure of evil, the momentary joy it offers to the heart of corruption that's under that surface, the lasting pain that we're going to bring on ourselves and our others if we don't resist it. We have to train ourselves by God's grace, by faith, to do this. We must not take our stands on ways that are not good. We must reject evil. You will hate sin when you get to where you can look past what it offers to see what it costs and what it takes from you. You will hate sin when you love Jesus and you see what sin did to him. Sin pinned him to that cross. Sin resulted in him being separated from the Father. And we have to contemplate those things when we're confronted with the allure of evil. What we think about in unoccupied moments, the way of life in which we take our stand, what we reject, what we accept, all these things point to what we regard as sacred and ultimate. For the wicked, it's not God that's sacred and ultimate. Sin is. The wicked worship sin, and thereby they worship themselves. The righteous, praise God, this psalm's going to take a turn from a really negative analysis of the wicked to this soaring celebration of God. The righteous worship God. So this is where we want to be. This is where we want to live. This is, this is what we want to, to, to write on the tablets of our hearts, which is to say we want to train the, the neurons and the synapses of our brains to, to create these kinds of connections between these words so that these terms and these phrases echo through our minds at all times. Because we don't want to live in Proverbs chapter 4. Listen to this statement from Proverbs 4. <clears throat> um, Solomon, uh, descri- I'm sorry, yeah, it's Proverbs chapter 4, verse 16. We don't want to live here. He says, He says of of the evil ones, the wicked, they cannot sleep unless they've done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. Have you ever had that experience where you're, you're lying in bed and you just can't get to sleep because there's this temptation that's just nagging at you, gnawing at you, and, and you can't sleep because you're dealing with it. You don't want to live there. That's not where you want to be. You want to be in this statement in Proverbs chapter 6, where Solomon says to his son, he says, my son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. In other words, memorize the Bible. That's what he's, that's what he's commending. And then he says, this is what the words of the Bible will do for you. Proverbs 6, 22. When you walk, they will lead you When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. You want the Bible to talk to you when you wake up in the morning? you got to memorize it. And and I submit to you that there's no better passage to start with than right here, Psalm 36, verses 5, really through the rest of the psalm. But but 5 through uh, 9 or so would be a great passage to memorize. So, So here's a challenge for you. As, as you lay down to go to sleep, why not make the last thing that you look at the Bible? Why not make the last thing that you think about as you lie down to go to sleep at night the Scripture, some passage that you're trying to commit to memory, or just read it over and over again every night and, and, and let it talk to you. So we come to the worship of the righteous in verse 5. And what's happening here is David is moving from a description of the wicked and what they worship worship to the object of his own devotion. And here David's poetry soars to unmatched splendor. These are the words of a man who knows God, a man who is practiced in his praise, a man whose public paean of praise is rooted in private devotion. So we don't want to be the people just put on a show when we show up to church or just do things when we're going to be seen. We want to be people who walk with God in private. We want to be people who, when we're lying on our bed, we're not plotting trouble. We're thinking about these realities. 
Look at what David says in verse 5. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O God. There are several other statements like this in the Psalter. They're just magnificent. Psalm 57, 10, David says, Your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Same, same concepts that we've got here in 36, 5. He says in 75, 19, Your righteousness, O God, reaches the high heavens. He says in 103, 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. 108.4, your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. These statements, they're founded on, on the association of the Lord himself with the transcendent heavens. So Deuteronomy 33.26 Moses says, there's none like, like God who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. There is no higher place than the heavens. Nothing extends to a greater distance. So it, what, what David is doing here is he's celebrating the all-encompassing steadfast love of the Lord on the way to church this morning. I tried to start a new family tradition this year of, of either listening to or reading Charles Dickens's Christmas Carol. It's, it's a really short thing, and, and so we're listening to it on the way to church this morning. And one of the most characteristic aspects of Charles Dickens is that the man loves goodness. He, he, he's such a happy author. Goodness and joy pervade Charles Dickens. And it's like what David is saying here is that God's steadfast love pervades creation. God's steadfast love is everywhere. There is nowhere you can go under heaven or in the skies where you will not be exposed to God's steadfast love. This is who he is. His steadfast love extends to the heavens. His faithfulness, you could, you could translate this, truth, his commitment to truth, that's what faithfulness is. Faithfulness is you are aligned in what you say and what you do with the truth. His truth or his faithfulness extends to the clouds. It's everywhere, inescapable. There's no conflict between God's love and God's truth. I want to I want to quote this passage to you from G.K. Chesterton's little book, Orthodoxy. And Chesterton is, he's addressing people who want to be their own God. And, and if you refuse to worship the God of the Bible, that's really what you're becoming. You're, you're trying to become your own God. And if that's you this morning, if you're rejecting the God of the Bible and you think, oh, you're, I'm, I'm just our religious. No, you're not our religious. Really what you are is you're indulging in the religion of yourself. And this is what G.K. Chesterton says to you. So, you are the creator and the redeemer of the world. But what a small world it must be. What a little heaven you must inhabit, with angels no bigger than butterflies. How sad it must be to be God and an inadequate God. Is there really no life fuller and no love more marvelous than yours? And is it really in your small and painful pity that all flesh must put its faith? How much happier you would be. How much more of you there would be if the hammer of a higher God could smash your small cosmos, scattering the stars like spangles and leave you in the open, free like other men to look up as well as down. Don't you want a bigger God than yourself? That's what Chesterton is saying to you. God's love and truth reach to the skies above, and underneath are the mountains of God's righteousness. Look at verse 6 there. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. God's righteousness is likened to mighty mountains. Now think about mountains, solid, sheer, awesome walls of rock before which we feel so small. 
David is using the limits of the known world, isn't he, to describe the character of the Lord. The heavens and the clouds for his hesed, his steadfast love, his loving kindness. The mountains for his righteousness. And then there in verse 6, your judgments are like the great deep. The great deep is the abyss of the sea. And this comparison speaks to the profound, unsearchable, many-layered decisions that God has handed down from his divine seat of justice. The skies, the mountains, the seas, these are the most mesmerizing aspects, the most mesmerizing features of creation, aren't they? The sky is enchanting in its beauty. Maybe, maybe you've, on, a, on a, a summer's day, you've just, I don't, I don't know if it's lie or laid, laid there on the ground. I'm sure I misuse that word. I do it all the time. My kids make fun of me. Maybe you just laid there on the ground and looked up into that everlasting blue and just marveled at creation. And you know what's beautiful about these statements? Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. The way that David puts this communicates that there is no mountain of righteousness anywhere that isn't enveloped in the skies of God's steadfast love. God's love clothes and surrounds and pervades his righteousness. And then your judgments are like the great deep. You can stand on the seashore and get lost in the contemplation of the undulating ocean, can't you? And the wonders of God's judgment are, are just as rhythmic and powerful and unstoppable and constant as the waves of the sea. Chesterton has another quote that, that I, I thought of when I got to this place because, you know, you know, it's one thing to think about God's judgments in the abstract, but let's think about God's judgments in particular. And, and the, the particular decision of God that, Ch- that Chesterton is addressing here is, is the decision of God regarding sexual morality. And, uh, you know, th- th- this is really contested in our day. Uh, people want to be free to do what they please. They want to be free, free to uh, pursue their desires. I recently had a conversation with a guy who told me that he had left Christianity because, in his words, I had to be me. And uh, Christianity forbidded, forb- forbade an ethic that he wanted to pursue, and so he abandoned the faith. Well, Chesterton says of this, he says, I could never mix in the common murmur of that rising generation against monogamy because no restriction on sex seemed so odd and unexpected as sex itself. And then he he continues, he says, keeping to one woman is a small price for so much as seeing one woman. To complain that I could only be married once was like complaining that I had only been born once. It was incommensurate with the terrible excitement of which one was talking. A man is a fool who complains that he cannot enter Eden by five gates at once. Surely one might pay for extraordinary joy in ordinary morals. So God's God's commandments, God's laws, they're not bad for us. They're, they're, They're worth the joys, aren't they? God's judgments are like the great deep. And then, as though to keep us from thinking that God's attributes might be these abstract platitudes, David says, no, these things are, these are personal ways that God relates to his people to deliver those who depend upon him. He says there at the end of verse 6, man and beast, you save, O Lord. So you've got this steadfast love that extends to the heavens, this faithfulness to the clouds, righteousness like the mountains of God, judgments like the great deep, and he saves. He's a saving God. God is able to save. One of the ways that the Lord saves is by convincing us, convincing us of things like this, sins, paltry Emptiness is not worth losing the solid weight of God's glory. We become convinced of that, and we want to obey. We want to walk with this God. We want to think about his words. We want to have our minds renewed. 
And if you're here this morning and you're an unbeliever, that's what we want for you. We want for you what we want for ourselves. And that is to be entirely convinced, persuaded that the God of the Bible is real, that his word is true, and that his son is the Savior. And that if you walk with him and you trust him and you turn from, you resist evil, verse 4, you reject it, he'll save you. That's what we want for you. God's exquisite, steadfast love is a rare treasure to be prized. Look at what David says there in verse 7. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. David is worshiping the Lord, isn't he? All through these statements, celebrating God's love and his righteousness and his judgments, and then saying simply, how precious is your love, O God. And then people who have experienced this, people who have, who have come to know God, look at, look at what they do there in verse 7. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Why? Because they're convinced those wings will protect me. Those wings will protect me. Psalm 91 verse 4. David says, he says, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. And then David describes the way that while sin never leads to lasting joy, those who worship the Lord are satisfied on Him. Look at verse 8. They feast on the abundance of your house. You might, you might be looking at a translation, maybe the King James or some other translation, that, that has some variation of the word drink, or they, they quench their thirst on the abundance of your house, something like that. And then it goes on, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. There are actually two terms for drinking here. The, the word feast is a, a word for drinking. So they drink from the fatness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. They, they quench their thirst. This points to the way that the Lord pours out his fullness for his parched people. God, God's house, where David said, Psalm 23, 5 and 6, he, he said, uh, surely goodness and mercy, mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. And then he said in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have asked of the Lord, that, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. God's house is amply supplied as a place of shelter and communion and refuge, and satisfaction. People who live there will be satisfied. This last phrase of verse 8, you give them drink from the river of your delights. The consonants of that Hebrew word rendered delights and the pointing are the exact same used to point to the, or to, to describe the primeval garden, Eden. You give them drink from the river of your Eden. That's what this says. This is saying, David is saying, you satisfy me with your very presence. That was the best thing about Eden, being in the presence of God. Uh, the, these, these references to God's house and to the river of his delights, his Eden, these point to the way that God satisfies his people with his presence. He communes with us as our Father. And, and the drinking that we've just read about in verse 8, you give them drink. Look at verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life. With you is the fountain. That's what we drink from. People who enjoy God's presence drink from the fountain of life. And then it goes on to say, in your light do we see light. God is the one who said in the beginning, let there be light. Any perceptive capacity that any human has is enabled by God's light. In your light, do we, it, it begins with God's revelation, let there be light. And it continues with God's assistance and God's grace and God's, God's enabling power. The Lord 
enables all perception of any man. Let, let, me, let me suggest to you a New Year's resolution in response to Psalm 36, 7 through 9. And, and, you know, this is really the most important thing for any of us, for all our lives. Be a worshiper. Commit yourself anew to being a worshiper this year. Cultivate it. Practice it. Think about it. Take, take terms like this and don't let these go. Hold on to them. And then, and then try to become better at your praise of the Lord. More consistent in your praise. More steadfast in your enjoyment of Him. Those who have found the fountain of life will want to continue to drink the living water that flows from it. And so it's no surprise that David says in verse 10, this is how we should pray, Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Continue it, Lord. I need more of you. He prays in verse 11, Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me. He doesn't want to be trodden underfoot nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. Uh, this, this, the hand of the wicked driving him away, I think what he's saying is, don't let the wicked drive me away from you, from worshiping you. Now, how would the, how would the wicked do that? Well, they would convince him that the Bible's not true, that God's not trustworthy, and that maybe all of this stuff is mistaken. I'm going to quote from G.K. Chesterton one more time. He's got this great quote about, about orthodox belief. And this is what he says. He says, this is the thrilling romance of orthodoxy. People have fallen into a foolish habit of speaking of orthodoxy as something heavy, humdrum, and safe. There never was anything so perilous or so exciting as orthodoxy. It was sanity, and to be sane is more dramatic than to be mad. It was the equilibrium of a man behind madly rushing horses, seeming to stoop this way and to sway that, yet in every attitude having the grace of statuary and the accuracy of arithmetic. And then a little bit down the page, he says, It is easy to be a madman. It is easy to be a heretic. It is always easy to let the age have its head The difficult thing is to keep one's own. It is always easy to be a modernist, as it is easy to be a snob. It is always simple to fall. There are an infinity of angles at which one falls, only one at which one stands. And then he describes the way that the church has been true to the faith, the the, the orthodox faith in the scriptures across the ages. He says, to have fallen into any one of the fads from Gnosticism to Christian science would indeed have been obvious and tame. But to have avoided them all has been one whirling adventure. And in my vision, the heavenly chariot flies thundering through the ages, the dull heresy sprawling and prostrate, the wild truth reeling but erect. What a great thing the faith is. What an exciting adventure it is to know God and to walk with Him. Let not the hand of the wicked drive us away from it. And then then David closes in verse 12, looking at the outcome of the wicked. Sin offers a momentary joy, but it leaves you with a lasting regret. And in the end, you will gain eternal destruction. Look at verse 12. There the evil doers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. This again is like Psalm 1, where David said that the wicked will not rise in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Those who worship God, those who experience the loftiness of His love, the deep roots of of the mountains of his righteousness. They'll drink from the fountain of life and forever bask in his light. It's, it's hard to, to find ways to, to describe how good this is to know God and to walk with him. And so sometimes it's helpful to, to, to look at cases of people who have, who have known God and who have walked with God. And uh, there's a woman named Phyllis Wheatley 
who in 1761, she was brought to this country as a slave on a slave ship from Africa. And at that time, she was seven or eight years old. And um, in 1773, when she was only 19 years old, she had a, a collection of poems published. She was only the second woman in the United States of America to have a book published, and she was the first African American to publish any book. And it is thoroughgoing Christianity. There, there's a poem in here on the death of her pastor. There's a poem on the death of George Whitfield. She loved the gospel. And, and this is what Phyllis Wheatley drank from the fountain of life. She drank from the fountain of life, and so her harsh servitude was transformed for her. This is what she says. This is a poem entitled, On, Bring, On Being Brought from Africa to America. She says, it was mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a Savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew, some view our sable race, black race, with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember, Christians, Negroes black as Cain may be refined and join the angelic train. Somebody that talks like that is somebody that has experienced the river of God's delight. Somebody who has feasted on the abundance of God's house. Let's pray together. Father, would you make us like Phyllis Wheatley? Lord, would you make us like those who have walked with you in ages past? Make us those who know your goodness. Make us like David, Lord, who loved to worship you. God, make it so that your word talks to us when we rise up in the morning, so that when we lie down at night, your promises comfort us. So that when we wake in the middle of the night, the goodness of your word keeps us from evil. And Lord, cause us to be people who have private lives of devotion that bear fruit in public acts of praise. Father, we pray that you would be everything to us. We pray that through Christ, we would, not, we would walk with you and know you. And we ask it for your everlasting glory. In Jesus' name, amen.